so you can see here uh, how to get in touch with me. I put LinkedIn first, uh, not because I love LinkedIn, but because in certain parts of the world, more people use LinkedIn than say Twitter. But that's where you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, my website, and my programming-oriented uh, blog. Uh, you can also read some articles at blog.jbrainsud.ca, which are more about all the topics around programming and design, which is a little bit more of what I'm going to talk about today. So one of the first things is to... I, I, I don't know how other people think of the term legacy code, but when I think of legacy code, uh, I mean profitable code that we feel afraid to change. So many of you are probably familiar with Michael Feather's classic work, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, which is kind of the, I think it remains today, the classic description of how to deal with legacy code mostly uh, as code. And so, yes, maybe not as many of us are working in C and C++ as we might have been 20 years ago, uh, but at the same time, uh, not a lot. One of the nice things about legacy code is that uh, the, the trade-offs involved really haven't changed much. And so a book like Working Effectively with Legacy Code falls into that wonderful category of being a classic, not code for being old and obsolete, but more as some things never change. And if you have read that book, or even if you haven't, you might be aware that uh, Michael described legacy code as code without unit tests. And I kind of understand that point of view, and there definitely is this, uh, you can tell that a programmer wrote that because they were very focused on implementation details and weren't very good at expressing intent. And it always bothered me, code without unit tests, in part because I don't want to get into arguments with people about what a unit is, um, and in part because telling you that legacy code is code without unit tests uh, first of all, very absolute. I would even say it's more like code without enough unit tests or code without unit tests that we trust enough. But even then, I'm forced to ask the important question, the first question that any junior programmer starts to ask as they progress in their career, which is, why is that? Why do you care about that? Why does that help you? And for a long time, I used the idea that legacy code was code I feel afraid to change. So. It kind of started with code without tests, then it was code without enough tests, and then it was code without tests that we don't trust enough. And if you keep asking why, or as I kept asking why, I eventually got to code that I feel afraid to change. And then of course, since my feelings are always what the rest of the world feels, then I project my feelings onto everyone else. So clearly it has to be code that we feel afraid to change. And then somebody in a training class about five years ago asked one of those great, or made one of those great comments that just made me stop and rethink what I was saying. Because he said, well, why don't you just throw it away? And I had that moment like, oh, right. Why don't we just throw it away? Well, we, and then I launched into my usual canned speech about, you know, here's a story of, of, uh, uh, of why we don't throw the code away. And it all boils down to the code is more profitable than the programmers in this room. And for me, that was, that was, uh, it was one of those things that sometimes when you teach a topic, you say things and you make an, or you don't say things because you assume everybody already agrees because it's such a fundamental, you know, central point of your thinking. It's, um, it, it goes without saying not because everybody, nobody is stupid enough not to think it, but it goes without saying because We've genuinely built enough shared understanding around this that surely everyone understands by now that legacy code is profitable and that's why we're stuck with it. But I realized at that moment that I guess I had taken this idea too much for granted. So now that's why I make a big deal and I'm willing to spend several minutes on emphasizing the point that when I say legacy code, I mean profitable code that we feel afraid to change. And the key phrases there are profitable code, which means that we respect it. The code is probably generating much more value than we, the entire programming team, is generating on a year-by-year -year basis. So we need to respect that code and not, when we yell at it, when we get frustrated by it, uh, we can do that all we want as long as we remember that that code is paying literally our salary. The other thing is that we feel afraid to change. And I think the we feel part is really important because familiarity affects our feeling about the code. 
In a sense, legacy code can stop feeling like legacy code for a small group of people if they become too familiar with it. And that's why it's important to inject new people into the project working on that legacy code over time so that they can bring fresh eyes, renewed energy, and renewed frustration, the things that provide the energy that helps us push forward. And so obviously the last part about that we're afraid to change it, if we don't need to change legacy code, if we can just sit on this side of the fence and it can sit on that side of the fence and nobody bothers each other, then we don't need to worry about it. And so I really think that all three of these ingredients are important. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, you understood that these three ideas, proper code that we feel afraid to change, um, forms the fundamental or forms the foundation of everything that I'm going to say over the next little bit. So um, I've been teaching a workshop over the last several years that I call Surviving Legacy Code. Uh, uh, I've taught at, uh, you know, in companies, I've done it as full day workshop sessions, I've done it as sort of half day workshop or conference uh, um, sessions. And the three general categories of things that we do in order to survive legacy code are essentially rescue the code, organize the work and navigate the people. And of course, keep in mind that this assumes uh, obviously the fourth option, which isn't on the list is don't is, you know, uh, put the legacy code into the corner and then back away slowly and never touch it again. Uh, clearly, we always have the option of doing that. The best way to block the kick is not to be there. Maybe Karate Kid references are getting a little too old now. But the idea is that these are the three things that if we're forced to work with legacy code, these are the three central areas of challenge that we're going to have to deal with. And I imagine that a lot of what uh, you've heard today and a lot of what you thought about in working with legacy code is focused on the rescuing the code part. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I want to make sure that we also have in mind um, a, a picture that is other than the typical picture of well-meaning, energetic, fired up programmers rushing in with fire hoses, trying to spray water all over the legacy code to put the fires out. That skill is important, and you're probably all the other things that you've heard about today that you will hear about today, a lot of the code-oriented stuff is going to help build your skill in that direction. But I, that leaves me with two key questions. One is, how do I develop that skill if I don't have it now? In other words, if I don't feel very confident in my ability to rescue the design, how do I get started? And what are the other techniques, the other parts of the work that I need to worry about? One thing that many programmers lose sight of is, well, I mean, in general, programmers like to focus on the code and the design and the tests because that's what they know, that's what interests them, that's what makes them happy. That's how I got started. Um, and so in general, programmers need a, often need a little bit of a push to move outside of the realm of code to think about the other two key areas, which is how to organize the work and how to navigate the people involved. And so at the best of times, programmers on average have a deficit of skill and attention in this area. And so that's why it's important for me to, well, back when travel was legal, to walk the countryside around Europe, uh, go from city to city three months out of the year and encourage dozens or hundreds of programmers to put more attention into these areas. But when we're working with legacy code, the importance of organizing your work and navigating the people involved is even higher, much higher, because the work is more chaotic, unbounded, unplanned, in many ways unplannable in that sense. It's very easy to get lost. You're going to have the impulse to chase every rabbit you see, uh, you're going to be distracted easily. These are all reasons why focusing on organizing the work, both your own work and the work of the group, the team, the department, the company, becomes even more difficult. And the kinds of fights that you usually have, the struggles, the fights, the arguments, the disagreements about how to organize work, about how to run projects, about how to plan, those problems are bad enough at the best of times. They're an order of magnitude worse when we're working with legacy code because of how inherently uncertain that is. 
And then with navigating the people, well, okay. Um, even today, uh, it's not totally unreasonable to talk about the prototypical personality type of the programmer, this sort of introverted, uh, hyper-rational, um, you know, uh, maybe overly optimistic uh, problem solver, tinkerer. Um, and those are wonderful uh, problem solving personality types, but they are personality traits, but they sometimes uh, don't, it causes programmers to have trouble playing well with others. And again, this is an issue the most of the time, right? Uh, we routinely, even when we're not working legacy code, we routinely have difficulties interacting with each other, communicating with each other, um, you know, uh, navigating the emotional content of our work, uh, managing our stress levels, all those things. And all of those issues are heightened when we work with legacy code because legacy code is inherently uncertain. And the uncertainty, it's like we turn the uncertainty dial up to about 14 in a way that makes most people horribly uncomfortable most of the time. And you know, when I usually talk about this, I don't have a global pandemic to point to as an illustration of how extreme this can be. Now, I'm not saying that working with legacy code is the same level of uncertainty as am I going to have an income stream for the next two years while we figure out how to deal with how we figure out how to get a vaccine for this uh, disease, but more that you can see both at the large scale and at the smaller scale the kind of irrational behavior that comes from uncertainty that. Instead of seeing it as a manageable thing among the handful of people that you work with on a daily basis at your job, you can see what happens when that uncertainty makes thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people uncomfortable. You know, if, if, if you're like me and you live in a small town of 10,000 people, we can kind of fool ourselves into believing that it's not that bad out there. But if you live in, you know, Montreal, Toronto, big cities around the world, where around three, five, 10, 20 million people, then imagining how uh, irrationally they behave because of the power that this uncertain situation has all over them, you can see just how important it is to both understand your own reactions and understand other people. And so when we're working with legacy code, it's sort of somewhere in between normal everyday job and global pandemic. Uh, but you can see that the, uh, if you had a tendency to underestimate the power that this uncertainty has to cause people to behave strangely, you're seeing it everywhere you look right now. And so that's why I want to talk about some basic, uh, some starter tools that can help you deal with all those things. So let's start with the central conflict of legacy code which is that you want, to, uh, you want to refactor the code in order to make it easier to change. But before you do that, you want to write tests because those tests make the code safer to refactor. But unfortunately, because everything is tangled horribly um, and you don't necessarily know how bad it is in every part of the code until you look, every time you try to add a test, your, your head slams against a brick wall and you realize that you want to be able to change the code a little bit here and there in order to be able to reduce the cost of adding those tests. And so here's a uh, positive feedback loop of pain and suffering, where in order to refactor, I want to add tests, but in order to not spend all my waking time adding tests, I need to refactor. How do I get off this merry-go-round? And most programmers assume that the primary way to resolve this conflict is testing. I've said that. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, have said that. Uh, some people who have spoken earlier in the day have probably said that. Where uh, let's assume that our primary strategy is going to be adding tests. How do we manage that? How do we add tests? What are the technical hurdles that we have to deal with? What are the organizational hurdles that we have to deal with? And what are the interpersonal hurdles that we have to deal with? But adding tests, it can be very easy for especially for the programmer mind to focus in on adding tests and to assume that that is the primary strategy and in extreme cases to assume that that is the only strategy and that therefore they need to focus all their energy on getting better at adding tests. 
And I, I strongly believe and have experienced that if you focus your attention too much on that, then you are overpaying for a guarantee and you're not gonna be happy with the results. Adding tests is important. I've built my career on teaching people about testing, but uh, there's more to talk about here. And especially one of the problems in this conflict is this feedback loop creates unbounded amounts of rework. Uncertainty goes up to 14 again, and everybody panics. So what are some of the things that we can do that can help us manage this panic, that can help us avoid the uh, typical situations where either we get lost in this conflict, we feel completely helpless, and so we just back out, we quit, and we try something else, or we attack this conflict head on, we perhaps strongly disagree on the tactics, we over we we fall prey to the uncertainty, we overpay for a guarantee in some situations, we don't do enough work in other situations, and the whole thing seems utterly chaotic and destined never to converge to a reasonable result. And then there are, of course, all manner of, uh, all manner of outcomes in between those extremes, and we're thoughtful to them, it's a mess. How do we deal with all that? What I'd like to do over the next few minutes is to, um, is to sort of, if you find yourself mired in the center of this conflict and it feels like a war zone and you don't know what to do and everywhere you turn, it seems to be chaos, then I'd like to sort of reach down, grab you by the arm, pull you up and give you a few ideas for things that you can do away from this battlefield, away from this central conflict that will either directly or indirectly give you better tools to deal with this central conflict directly. You are going to have to deal with this conflict head on, but especially if you don't feel ultra confident in your abilities to refactor and add tests, then perhaps you need to spend some time practicing away from this battlefield in a way that allows you to prepare better to attack this conflict head on. So one of the things that I want to start with is micro committing. So when I say micro committing, I mean committing changes absurdly frequently. However frequently you commit now, twice as frequently. And the idea of micro committing is, you know, if I go back to this central conflict for a moment, so at 90 degrees to the screen pointing out at you is uh, the thing that you do before you can even think about writing tests or refactoring, which is committing more often. If you can't write tests because it's technically difficult, because you don't understand which tests to write, then step zero is uh, treat the system like the complex system that it is, try something and commit it, try something and commit it, try something and commit it, and do this in micro steps. I mean, I, maybe it even makes better sense to call this nano committing, pico committing, I don't know. But however often you commit now, do it more often, absurdly often, more often than feels comfortable. The idea here, so there's two things. One is when you're committing this frequently, you're creating an undue you're creating a bunch of undue uh, uh, spots in your change history that allows you to compensate for the fact that you don't even have the tests you want to run yet. So maybe you don't, maybe you can't justify running a bunch of manual tests more than once every few hours or a few times a day. Or maybe you have manual tests, but they're so, or automated tests, but they're so slow they only run overnight. Or you have to stop for 15 minutes even to write the to run the tests. Uh, maybe writing a line of code and taking 15 minutes to run the tests is slower than it needs to be, even if you think it gives you a lot of, of, uh, of uh, confidence. What you can do in the meantime that gives you, say, 60% of the benefit at 5% of the cost is just commit absurdly frequently so that when you run the tests and they fail, the good news is that you probably only made a mistake in the last three hours or so and then you can use by search to figure out exactly where the mistake was. 
And yeah, it's not as nice as having that red flashing light on your laptop that says you just made a mistake in the last 20 seconds, which we normally have when we say practice test driven development. But I think this idea is one of those things that allows us to balance the cost between, you know, avoiding the cost of running these very slow tests more often while getting a lot of the benefit of running them. So the good news is that you can practice micro committing everywhere, which means you can practice it where it's already easy. So for example, if you're working on some feature or you're working on some hobby project where you're practicing test driven development, I in the sense of learning to practice or in the sense of just, this is how I write code, then put special attention on going back to the micro committing practice of say, I always commit on a green bar. I always commit every time I have a passing test or I, you know, I'm going to practice committing the smallest changes I can think of until it gets really uncomfortable. And the idea is not that you should micro commit like this all the time, but it's like when you're in a situation where you don't know what else to do, you don't have tests, you don't have this way of getting rapid feedback, but you don't want to throw away three hours of work, five hours of work, a day of work, then you can use micro commits as a way of giving yourself, you know, 150 undo points in the last three hours of work so that you can spend 30 minutes figuring out exactly where the mistake was. And that might be better than trying to run a 20 minute test suite twice an hour. And you can use this micro committing practice anywhere you want, right? In the worst case, you micro commit and then when you try to push code to the rest of the team, you have to squash because if you give the rest of the team 137 commits in two hours of work, they'll kill you. While you are negotiating them becoming more comfortable with smaller commits, you uh, can micro commit as much as you want wherever it's already easy. And in the work, you just have to do a bit of squashing before you show that to anybody else. What that helps you do is build the habit build the impulse of committing extremely small changes so that somebody throws you or you dive into a leg code situation where you find yourself locked in that conflict the impulse to go back to micro commits as a way of providing a, a place to start before you even write tests that becomes an impulse that you feel and that you don't feel resistance to uh, so really the idea here is to use micro committing not because it's a good idea in general, but because when you need it, uh, it's nice to have practiced and uh, removed the resistance to doing it in the moment when you really need it. I, I want you to um, feel the impulse to drop down to absurdly small commits in that moment where you realize that even trying to run tests is too expensive. So uh, don't dive into micro committing on legacy code. Start micro committing where it's already easy in features that you're building in parts of the system that you understand, in your hot projects, on cuts, any of that kind of stuff. Practice micro committing where it's easy. Do it for an hour, two hours. Build a habit so that when you find yourself in an industrial strength situation and you can't run tests easily, when you know that you have the impulse to then just do micro commits, then you can feel like, ah, it's working. I'm building the habit that's going to help me in a difficult situation. And so related to this is the more general idea of practicing refactoring where it's already easy. So whether that's practicing test-driven development or, or, or evolutionary design in parts of the system that you already understand, hot projects, katas, wherever it is, Note that if we go back to the central conflict, the two main ways to resolve this conflict are to add tests or to make refactoring safer in other ways. And it's the second one that many programmers forget is even an option. Now, granted, uh, you allowing me to refactor code without tests, if it's your code, uh, requires an awful lot of trust. And maybe we need to do some things in order to build that trust over time. And so that falls into some of the interpersonal stuff I want to talk about a little bit later. But it's important to understand that um, uh, 
many programmers fall into the trap of believing that adding tests is the only sensible, responsible way to resolve this conflict, and it isn't. If we can add tests because they're not all that expensive, because we're working in code that we reasonably well understand, we're working in code that's reasonably well designed, then adding tests isn't so expensive, and we can just feel free to add tests as our primary uh, strategy. But when you're work, when you're locked in the death grip of this conflict, uh, adding tests is too expensive in many situations. And so, if you increase your overall refactoring skill, then you drive down the risk of refactoring without tests. This is not a license to refactor however much you want with no tests. This isn't a license to become sloppy. This is more a recognition that in desperate situations, it might be acceptable to do something that would ordinarily not be acceptable. Watch any medical drama on TV and eventually you'll see a scene where somebody has to, do, has to perform surgery in a not sterile environment. This is not a thing that you do every day, but you want to be in a situation where, or you want to uh, develop the skills so that if you're forced in a situation where surgery in an, uh, in an unsterile environment is better than the alternative, you want to maximize the safety of being able to perform that surgery. That's the idea here. And so if you practice your refactoring skill in general, then you'll find it easier and safer and less stressful and less expensive to refactor just enough in the right places so that you can then add tests wherever you want. One of the things that many programmers get stuck in, and this is something that I've seen a lot over the last 10 years, programmers don't allow themselves to practice the mechanics, the low level of re uh, mechanics of refactoring often enough to take advantage of what psychologists call chunking. So you're familiar with chunking, uh, the idea that you learn things and you have to focus a lot on the details of everything as you go. And then gradually, as you become more familiar and comfortable with those details, you, you learn which things to abstract away, which details to ignore. And gradually, you start to think of complicated things as simple little things. So you can imagine, uh, think back, well, imagine back to what it was like to learn how to read. At the very beginning, you had to learn how to decipher all these weird shapes. And somebody taught you that this is how you draw A, and this is how you draw B, and this is how you draw C. And then gradually, you got through lots of repetitive practice. You no longer had to think about this is A, this is B, this is C. You could even be okay with the fact that sometimes we draw A like this, and sometimes we draw A like this, and sometimes we draw A like that. Eventually, you got to the point where you just thought of it as A. And then, so that's chunking, where I can see these various glyphs, and I think of them all as the abstract concept of the letter A. And then you can apply that same chunking idea to letters forming syllables, syllables performing, uh, 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 becoming words, words becoming sentences, words becoming phrases. If you've ever learned a, an idiomatic expression in another language, you could use that expression successfully even before you understand the origins and what, the, what it means you know, word by word. Um, I notice this a lot as I'm continuing to learn Swedish, that I can, I can use certain idiomatic expressions in Swedish, and then three months later, I learn the vocabulary that allows me to understand what the individual words mean, and then I say, ah, now, I understand. now it's an easier way for me to remember the expression. My point is that this chunking is what allows us to form more complicated thoughts and to do more complicated and powerful things with the tools around us. You're not going to be able to write a book if you have to waste your energy on figuring out how to draw A. And this is where a lot of programmers get stuck. They don't practice the low-level mechanics of refactoring enough in order to chunk. So the low-level mechanics are things like when to run your tests, when to commit, how to extract, how to inline, how to rename, how to move, and how to do those things safely. Now, if you learn those key steps and practice those key steps, the first sort of step zero, if you will, is to get to the point where you can do all those things effortlessly, where you don't have to remember the keystroke combination in your IDE, where you don't have to think about what text editor movements you're going to use. When you get to the point where 
You see that you want to rename a, 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 a method that's a private method inside a class in Java, and you know how to do that. For some reason, you're working in Vim, because why not? Although you should be working in Kakun by now. Um, you know you're chunking when you can see in your mind's eye, or when you can immediately think of the string of Vim commands that does renaming safely. And not the string of Vim commands, but also the string of Vim commands combined with how to run your tests and how to uh, check the output. Um, when you get to the point where you could almost put that in a script and then run the script, that's chunking. Most programmers don't get to the point where they can move the code around easily because they waste too much of their energy trying to remember how to rename, how to do change method signature, when to run the tests, when to commit. And so I encourage you to practice those mechanics in areas where it's already easy. Spend an hour or two hours working on, again, familiar code, familiar features, where you focus your energy on following strictly the rules of commit on every green bar, on when to run the tests. Open the classic refactoring book, which gives you step-by-step -step instructions about how to move a method from one class to another class safely by hand. Practicing that by hand, I don't encourage that because I'm old and I had to do it, so you should have to do it too. I'm not, I'm not recommending that you practice it because you should ignore that your, ID, that your IDE can do it for you, but more to help you uh, take advantage of this chunking uh, that happens in the mind when you practice steps, micro steps, mini steps, often enough that they become effortless. When you reach the point where those, where those small steps become effortless, then it becomes easier to think in terms of moves. I, do, I rename this thing, then I move it onto that space, and then I move it over there, and that is a common pattern. That's a composite refactoring. If you don't practice the steps, you will never take advantage of chunking, and you will, find it, you will constantly find yourself stumbling over thinking of higher level moves. So, Instead of trying to repractice this in the legacy code where you're under stress and it's painful and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's difficult and there's lots of resistance, practice it in katas and in uh, greenfield code, code that you're familiar with, where you can turn the discipline level up to 11 and build the, the uh, habits in such a way that, again, when you go into legacy code, you'll have the impulse to do the right thing. I don't like calling it the right thing, but you understand that I'm using it as shorthand for using the habits that we generally agree are going to be helpful. Okay, so let's talk a little less. That's enough about code for now, and I don't have a ton of time left, uh, but the good news is I don't need a lot of time. One of the things that uh, programmers tend to struggle with is organizing their own work. And when you're working in a relatively greenfield project where, you, where everybody understands the code, and the priorities among the team, uh, the priorities within the team are relatively clear, then it's relatively easy for you to be sloppy about how you organize your work and still get enough done. You have a bunch of things working for you. Um, the bottleneck is probably not the team's priorities, but rather the project priorities outside the team, uh, the project priorities within the context of the company's priorities or the department's priorities. And so you can afford to work on the wrong thing a lot, and it's not going to affect the bottom line. Or um, it's relative, you know, the, the communication between different departments and just information flow between different teams is so bad that uh, you're probably waiting a lot, a long time to get information that you need anyway. Bug reports are sitting in other people's inboxes. You're waiting for a testing a tester to reproduce a defect. You're waiting for feedback from a real customer about a problem that there was. And so you essentially have a lot of time that you can afford to waste. And then you don't have to be that good at organizing your own work. But when you're working with legacy code, every step is painful, every step is expensive, and being efficient matters a lot more. And so you need to practice things like organizing your thoughts and writing things down, um, using things like the inbox technique from getting things done, making information easier to search, writing things, writing uh, information about the project that you're working on, things that you've discovered, things about the environment, things about technology tools that you rely on, writing in plain text or in markdown, which is easy to search for, 
putting it in a single place, putting it in a GitHub repository that everyone has access to, or putting it on a wiki for the four people in the world who still use wikis. Um, the, the idea there is that uh, you, know, you want to organize information so that it's available to people. Well, if you practice organizing information in situations where the stakes are low, again, spend an hour. Um, decide when you try to figure out how this technology or this library works, do it by writing a tutorial. Write a tutorial while you're figuring everything out. Edit the tutorial when you're done, and then publish it within the group. Maybe nobody will ever read that tutorial. But if they do, think about, first of all, how much easier it will be for them to find and how much it will save their time and energy when they do. And it's not because everybody in the, in the company is going to use that library that you just figured out how to use. But what it means is that when you're then stuck working inside legacy code and you're trying to learn all this stuff, you all have the impulse to write a tutorial that goes along with it. That's the point where it's actually going to be valuable for the people around you. And even if the tutorial is terrible, the fact that you have built the impulse to write those things down, get them out of your head, make them searchable, and make them available for other people, that can help a lot when it comes time to waiting chest deep in legacy code. You never know which things you discover are going to be useful to other people. So it's best to err on the side of writing it all down and making it easily searchable even if it looks ugly, and even if it's a little bit hard to read. I can tell you that if I have no idea how this part of the system is supposed to work, and if I read three paragraphs that you wrote six months before, that's always better than nothing. And in the worst case, I know that you're somebody that I can use as a resource instead of wandering the countryside, bumping my head into walls trying to find somebody who knows that part of the code. So that's just one example. Another is experimenting with techniques like monotasking or Pomodoro technique, where you're working in short bursts, you're writing things down as you go, you know, make sure that you have paper and a pencil or a pen next to your computer while you work to write down all the ideas that come into your head that are distracting you while you're trying to focus on the current task, and then get back to work, focus on the current task, and do it until it's done. Those techniques, which come from works like getting things done, monotasking, Pomodoro technique, or any productivity technique that you can name, I guess they're useful in general, and they're crucial when working with legacy code. One of the things that I talk about a lot of programmers that they experience is what I call, you can't chase all the rabbits. Every time you dive into legacy code and try to work with it, you discover 35 things you want to fix. And if you rely on your sloppy way of managing work, where you just, oh, if I have these 35 things in my head, I better do them now, otherwise I'm going to forget about them. Or the classic programmer planning technique of, while I'm in here, let me just spend five minutes more doing this. And then while I'm in here, let me spend five minutes more doing that. You do that and suddenly the whole day is gone and you didn't actually finish anything. Or it's eight o'clock at night and you forgot to go home. In today's climate, this is even worse because think of how much easier it's going to be for you to justify trying to spend five more minutes working on something because your commute home is now just going into the next room. It becomes even more important to have this kind of disciplined habits around how you organize your work so that you don't just do things while you're thinking of them. So then you're not distracted by remembering, oh yeah, I want to do that refactoring later. Or, oh, yeah, we're really going to need to refactor that part of the system soon. If you use techniques like the inbox technique from getting things done, combined with something like monotasking or Pomodoro technique, then you help avoid falling into the trap of trying to chase every rabbit in the field. If you try to chase every rabbit in the field, you don't catch any of them. It's much better to write those things down as these distractions come to your head and then get back to what you're working on and focus. And if you've never worked with strong focus in a clear head, you won't understand how great it is until you do it. So again, you don't have to wait until you're working in legacy code to practice this. Practice this now on whatever you're working on. Spend an hour once a week, twice a week. Build the habit of using some of these techniques to organize your work. Even if that one hour of work feels like you only got 10 minutes of work done, the habit you're building 
are going to be of tremendous benefit when it comes time for you to dive into legacy code. And you will know how to deal with the 37 things racing through your mind. You will know how to deal with discovering things and being distracted by them because you can't work on them right now. Even you'll be able to manage the psych cost of feeling bad because you've discovered 12 problems and you're not going to be able to fix any of them today. Which leads me to the last thing I want to talk about, which is about playing better with others. And uh, it looks like I'm not going to have an opportunity to answer the questions now because I want to make sure you have a break. So I promise you, if you just keep asking questions even during the break, I will get a list of them and I'll answer them uh, later. Um, working with legacy code causes tremendous stress. Much more stress, more acute stress, and more chronic stress. So I want to be sure that everybody understands those words. Acute stress meaning that the feeling of stress comes to you suddenly and more intensely. And chronic stress meaning that that stress, you don't get very much recovery or rest from that stress. The legacy code is hanging over your head all the time. And so having some techniques for managing your own stress levels are even more important. It's even more important to do that when working with legacy code than your ordinary work. And whether we like it or not, we're getting, in a, we're getting a great opportunity to practice that here as we're dealing with suddenly everybody working from home and everybody being isolated. So the two main areas to work on are managing your stress levels better and refining your awareness and skill in areas like empathy and compassion. So there are a couple of things that you can do to start with. Uh, one of them is a model that I will, uh, uh, a model called the Satir Interaction Model. I'll, there'll be a reference on the slide at the end so that you can search uh, the web for it, find some articles and read about it for yourself. I want to talk about one key part of it. This is a model that helps programmers especially debug bad interactions. You have an argument with somebody, uh, it gets heated, somehow the argument stops. You go into the corner, you start crying, you pour yourself a, a glass of wine, and you wonder what the hell happened. So how do you debug that? One of the things that you can use is this model called the Satir Interaction Model, which provides a four-stage model for understanding how interaction happens so that you can try to figure out where things went wrong. The part that I want to mention is something that I call the fundamental irony of interaction. The last two parts of the Satir Interaction Model are the link between how you interpret what the other person said or did and how you respond to them. So if they raise their voice and you feel uh, attacked, then you start trying to defend yourself instead, and then you're defending yourself and you're probably yelling a little bit, or maybe you're crying, or you are, uh, you're deflecting your thoughts away from solving the problem towards rescuing your own ego. The path from interpreting what's happened to your response, that path is very difficult to change. It's part of your cultural upbringing. It's, it, you've been learning how to respond in various situations since you were old enough for someone to teach you the right way to act. And you've been getting conflicting messages, and those conflicting messages depend on who you grew up with, what your family was like, what your uh, regional culture was like, your national culture, uh, maybe your religious upbringing or your overall philosophy of life. And you've been building that connection steadily and deeply over time, which means that it's extremely hard to break. The idea is that the thing that you probably are objecting to the most is the other person's reaction. They don't like your reaction, you don't like their reaction. And when you object to their reaction and you try to change their reaction or you try to punish them for a bad reaction or you try to um, reward them for a good reaction, you're focusing your energy on the part that they are the least likely to change. So the fundamental irony of interaction says that if you focus your energy on their reactions, then you're very unlikely to change your interactions for the better. Focus instead on the interpretations. Part of that has to do with helping other people think of different ways to interpret how you are behaving, what you're saying, what you're doing, how you're doing it. And also, which is typically easier, changing how you interpret what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're reacting with. And again, you don't need to wait until you're working on Legacy Go to practice this. You can practice this all the time. You can practice this at home. 
with uh, with friends, with neighbors, with your family, well, not with neighbors right now, with your family in situations where stakes are low so that you build the habits of being more aware of your interactions while they're happening so that when you are in the highly stressful, highly charged situation of working with legacy code, your impulses will be to do more harmonious things instead of more destructive things. So uh, I could ask this question, um, where do you think that you, based on what I've told you and just some basic ideas how to get started, do you have a feeling for which of these things you would want to focus on first? So I'll give you about uh, 10 or 15 seconds if you want to answer this, then feel free. I'm just, it's interesting for me. I assume that you can go back to this and, and put in your answer anytime. Uh, so maybe we're not going to see the results here. That's the, it, that's the result of me not managing my time well enough. But I want to close and start here. Um, practice evolutionary design and test-driven development. I'm not, I'm not saying test-driven development is the best way to do evolutionary design, but the stronger your evolutionary design skills, the stronger your refactoring skills will be in those moments where you have to do surgery in an, in, in an unsterile environment. And yes, you should probably buy my training, but you don't have to buy my training if you don't want to. Uh, getting things done is a great place to start. Of course, if you find somebody who already has too much to do and you give them a 300-page book to read, they will throw the book at you. So instead, here is some places where you can get started with getting things done that doesn't require you to read a 300-page book before you get benefits. The Satir Interaction Model is a very nice way to get started being more aware of how you interact with people, not only to understand how they interact with you, but also to understand how you interact with them. And I've written a handful of articles over the years in a series I call Free Your Mind to Do Great Work. I think that these, and this, you know, there's all kinds of articles here that are in various topics that are not about legacy code, but they're about building the capacities and the skills and the habits and the impulses that will make it significantly less difficult for you to work with legacy code. So I apologize for going a few minutes over and taking some time out of your break. Uh, but please feel free to add questions and uh, I'll, you know, I'll wait another 10 or 15 minutes uh, and then I'll grab that list of questions and I'll get to work at figuring out how to write an article that you'll be able to read answering those questions. So thanks very much for your time and attention. I'm especially thankful to the organizers for inviting me and for allowing me to do this and for not yelling at me for going a few minutes over time.